So I spent 13 years in the Navy as a SEAL. I was enlisted uh, for eight years. Uh, I went to the school admiral program, which is the equivalent of green to gold, and got my commission in 2007. And I uh, was an officer for about five and a half years at SEAL Team 1 in San Diego. And my last job in the Navy was an operations officer at our largest training command uh, called ATC Advanced Training Command in San Diego. So I joined the Navy in 1999, went through BUDS Class 232. Uh, I spent about five and a half years uh, in San Diego at SEAL Team 3. Uh, like I said, I got picked up for Seaman Admiral as an E6. Uh, Chris Kyle that the movie American Sniper was made about was my uh, shooting partner. Uh, on September 2nd, we started uh, sniper school. And on September 11th, we were in sniper school when uh, the towers came down. My chief sent me to comm school and to JTAC school, and Chris got to go on to a follow-on uh, sniper school. So I know all the, all the guys that have authored books and had movies written about him. And, and if you see a book about me in a couple years, the bunker's not going well, right? So <laughs> that's not going to happen, though. <laughs> the bunker's going great, and uh, I'm too busy solving problems and helping us to, to go Ooh. write a book, right? And I also believe in being a, a silent slash loud professional at times. So, so before I get started and talk about some of the good stuff and some of the good things we have going on, I, I got to talk about a little gloom and doom that I see when I, I'm out meeting with uh, my civilian counterparts and pitching companies to give us money and talk about what we're doing. I see a real leadership vacuum uh, outside of the military. And there's potential there, right? There's innovation potential there. Because of all the sources of data and social media, there's paralysis by analysis. And I, I love being here and, and hearing what everybody's talking about today because that, that same uh, concept has came up. There's paralysis by analysis, but there's opportunity in that, right? I also see an education vacuum. The traditional uh, liberal arts four-year college still has uh, some, uh, it still pertains, but technology in the world is evolving so quickly that we're, uh, veterans getting out are going to have to adapt to have good jobs and understand technology because it's, it's growing exp uh, exponentially. So for more gloom and doom, there's 93 million Americans that are not in the workforce right now. You know, according to the 2012 census, there's about 300 uh, million Americans right now. So almost a third of everyone in the U.S. is not participating in the labor force. I would argue we, we cannot continue that trend where we have a, we're paying taxes and paying for everyone that's not in the system and we're having to take care of them. It's just not sustainable, especially when you look at the baby boom generation starting to exit the, the workforce. So keep that in mind, 93 million Americans are not in the workforce. I study a lot of nonprofits and talk to other nonprofits you know, the last two years since I've been putting the bunker together. Our philosophy of the bunker is if you teach someone to fish, they're gonna fish for a village. When you look at nonprofits that are out there, how many are teaching someone to fish and how many are just giving people fish, right? Think about that. We absolutely do not give people fish, we teach them how to fish. Uh, one of my favorite stories, that, when I was in San Diego, I was asked to help participate with a, uh, a nonprofit that takes military veterans on free fall uh, parachuting. They take them and they give them a free uh, tandem jump is what it's called, where they're strapped to a qualified instructor and they jump out of a plane and it's great. It's $12,000 for eight people to go through that training. I could do so much with $12,000 for a couple of veterans, it's, it just would blow your mind. So. I would love to slowly shift some of that money, you know, to uh, organizations that are teaching people to fish than just giving them fish because the long run is not helping. All right. So now for some of the good stuff, the bunker, we are leading an insurgency in the technology and the startup world. And it's fun. We are getting exposed to new education styles, new technology that vets haven't been exposed to. And, it's really only been to college kids getting out and going work in, in Silicon Valley. We're using our status as veterans to go and stand in rooms with uh, world-class entrepreneurs like Steve Blank, Brad Feld, listen to what they're ta talking about and then capture it to take it to the veteran community because the veteran community deserves it and has experiences, leadership, the management experiences that no one else has had. 
right? So we are leading an insurgency and we want to uh, have people join us in that insurgency. I get asked about the details of what we do and, and uh, the intricacies. I basically tell people we teach veterans how to eat an elephant. Does anyone know how to eat elephant? One, One bite at a time, right. Starting a small business it, on the, the, the full spectrum is enormous. You have to pare it down to every day, track your metrics, track your weekly progress, find mentors, and boil it down to a daily or weekly basis. If you try and if you look at the, the sum of how difficult it is, you know, you would quit, right? You, we eat an elephant day by day. So what is special about Kansas City? Why Kansas City? Why was Kansas City uh, selected as a, a chapter, one of the seven chapters we have nationwide? Uh, one reason is Google Fiber. Uh, a lot of Kansas City has gigabit speed internet, which the rest of the country does not. That has cybersecurity opportunities. That has big data opportunities. And lots of Silicon Valley companies are starting offices in Kansas City. We also have the Cisco Smart City project think big which is one of our partners is basically bringing the Cisco smart city project is going to drop a, a point in the middle of downtown Kansas City Missouri and for a 2.2 mile radius all the way around that there's going to be sensors that are tracking infrastructure they're going to be measuring uh, the water pressure in pipes to try and determine when they're going to break it's more efficient to determine when it's going to break and go out and do uh, maintenance or repairs then respond at three in the morning when you're paying people overtime to a broken water pipe. Uh, Barcelona, Spain, and San Jose, California, which is basically Silicon Valley, are the only places that have that right now. So it's a really neat time to be in Kansas City. But then the, uh, the biggest thing I love about Kansas City is the cost of living. Th you know, three months of savings goes so much further in Kansas City than it does in San Diego, where I lived for 13 years, or other places. And it's just, people are so nice. You can get in front of angel investors very easily in Kansas City. Whereas if you go out to New York or Silicon Valley, there's like two or three layers of people you have to go through before you actually talk to someone who's a decision maker. Lastly, what's neat about Kansas City is there's actually 10 military installations. I call them major military installations within it, like a six hour drive. So go all the way, all the way up off at Air Force Base in Nebraska, if you look at a, a radius around Kansas City, you know, Fort Leonard Wood, Tinker Air Force Base, uh, basically all the way around Kansas City, there's, you know, I estimate about 150,000 active duty military members, and it's probably on a conservative estimate. That's the probably the low end of that. So what we're trying to do is capture the best talent, the people that want to go for it, have great ideas into Kansas City, foster those ideas, help them develop, and eventually we're gonna have a bunker in Omaha and Oklahoma City and in St. Louis and Denver, and the insurgency is gonna grow. So when I talk to uh, my civilian counterparts and I'm pitching them for money, I love to show them this picture. This is my command photo uh, at uh, Naval Special Warfare Advanced Training Command 2012, where I was the ops officer. Yeah, I had 160 instructors that worked for me. They were all high risk qualified, which was an enormous paperwork uh, issue. Uh, they were all uh, wanted to reinvent their training pipelines, and that was an issue. And uh, you know, at a command, you have a CO, XO, and then you have ops. I was an ops officer, and we had actually five detachments nationwide that reported to me. We had uh, Debt Hawaii, Debt uh, Alaska. Um, Debt Panama City, Florida, <coughs> Debt Little Creek, uh, and then San Diego. So I, I would had a uh, quite the task. So I got out in 2012. I want to be an entrepreneur. I get out. I'm storming the beaches. I'm going for it, and I apply for four different small business loans, and I get denied at every single stop. The reason is that banks were not looking at my experience leading this many people on a 14 million dollar training budget they weren't counting that as past performance they were not counting that as past performance and why would they they don't know they really don't know what we're doing they really don't and we're part of the to, partially to blame right so I, what the the key for me is i found a mentor that helped me overcome those obstacles helped me sell myself better helped me prepare the loan 
to reflect the um, unique experiences I had. And on the fifth try, I got a small business loan. And that was, that's been the, the, uh, the catalyst for me as I had a mentor. And so what we do at the bunker is we have not just a mentor, a mentor in their industry. So we go out and find additional resources and take the time to try and find them an industry specific mentor, which a lot of other um, accelerator incubator programs don't do. We've talked about it here. Everyone knows the strategic corporal. Uh, what I what I talk to um, the Cerners and the Black of Black and Beaches and the Burns of McDonald about is since 2007, with the rise of uh, Coin Strategy, right? It pushes decision making down the lowest levels. Seven years later, we now have a uh, officer corps and NCO corps that's had tremendous responsibility. You know that I argue veterans haven't had since maybe World War II, right? This is a picture of a MARSOC unit uh, having a oil Shura and I believe outside Dalram or uh, near Helmand. I'm unemployable. I could not go work for another company, for, for a normal company. I'm unemployable. And it's because experiences like this. This is a J set my platoon did in Aqaba, Jordan with the 4th Maritime uh, Jordanian Commandos uh, in 2011. No one told me what to do. They just said, hey, LT, in three weeks, you're going to be in Aqaba training the Jordanians for eight weeks. Uh, I think there's an old PowerPoint on the server. Check that out. Uh, schedule a conference call with the embassy in Amman and uh, Special Warfare Unit 3 in Bahrain. Okay. I just made it happen. I No one told me. I, I planned uh, the entire exercise. I had my own budget. I was carrying around like $10,000 in cash to pay for things. Why would I want to go work for a company and have no leadership responsibility after doing this? I'm just unemployable is how I describe it. Uh, my counterpart was an uh, Army 06 from 3rd Group who was up in Oman uh, working at Kasadik, which is a big joint training center. Uh, and then my Jordanian counterpart was uh, uh, basically Army 07. And then Prince Abdul III came down and uh, trained with us for three days. So as I was a senior Navy guy, you can't screw up an exercise when, <laughs> when the prince of a country is, uh, is participating. If, they, if anyone knows that in Jordan, Jordanian military, the King Abdullah and his son, they do whatever they want. They fly Apaches, they fly uh, F-16s, they're maritime commandos whenever they want. So when he said he's coming down, he basically gets to do what he wants. So when you look at the successful, the characteristics of a successful entrepreneur and then that of a military veteran, they match up. Okay, the, the details on the left, the characteristics on the left, are from a, a Forbes study that was done a couple years ago when they were asked uh, employees of successful startups what what characteristics they looked for in a leader and why they were successful. And then the uh, details on the right, those characteristics were from a West Point study in 2012. The common, the common factor is perseverance. Veterans have that in their DNA. They are gonna stand, they're gonna stick it out be successful, make it happen. And that is not common, you know, outside of uh, the military. And Kansas City, they have a $2.3 billion endowment that Mr. K left them. And all they do is study entrepreneurship and then they promote it and they give out grants to specific programs. Uh, startups and entrepreneurship is, at, is actually at a 20 year low among you know the 20 to 44 year old age group. Okay. Additionally, uh, startups are shrinking as a port as a, basically a piece of the overall business uh, landscape. Since 1978, uh, the percentage of what all businesses are, 44%. It's dropped 40% that startups, um, as they break out with uh, all different types of businesses.
In the Coffin State of the uh, State of Entrepreneurship address that recently came out, uh, one of the authors of that study said it's a national emergency. What's going on? Is if you extrapolate out where we're at with new businesses and, and new job creation, uh, it's not getting better. So the term that I love about what we do and what we're creating is we're creating force multipliers. We're creating community force multipliers. Someone that's gonna lead a successful small business in a community that hires other veterans, that has more influence in a community as a business owner, that's what we're creating. Our goal is in 10 years, mm -hmm. there's gonna be a network of successful small business owners that, like I said, A, hire other veterans and take care of them that uh, decreases the reliance on the government and other nonprofits. And we create little spheres of influence. And when you overlap those and as it grows, we have a bigger say. What's also interesting about Kansas City is there is a, a long history of successful military veteran entrepreneurs in Kansas City. Uh, Jerry Reese of Reese and Nichols, if you've been around Kansas City, all you've, you've probably seen uh, Reese Nichols real estate. Jerry was a retired, or he was a Marine uh, Colonel in the reserves and uh, retired with 30 years in. Uh, Gary Fish started uh, Fishnet Security and Firemon and sold both of those companies recently for over $600 million. He was in the Army Reserves for about nine years. Lewis Ward uh, purchased Russell Stover Candies in 1960 and grew that into an empire and recently sold it for about $1.5 billion. And his family is still active, the Ward family in, in entrepreneurship in Kansas City. Uh, Lewis was a submarine officer. And then Henry Block flew 33 missions over Germany in World War II in the Army Air Corps. And he and his brother founded H&R Block, the, uh, you know, the tax empire. So Kansas City is, is amazing. When I show this, to dip them like a ton of bricks. Like, the Liberty Memorial that's there because of veterans. So there's a, a long history of entrepreneurship and, and uh, veterans being leaders in the, the community. So our core focus at the bunker is a six month training pipeline where we provide world-class resources to military veteran entrepreneurs. Our six months is broken down into three two month blocks. The first block, we stress test your idea. We force you to get out of your comfort zone and go out and talk to uh, people in your industry. One of the biggest misconceptions I see with entrepreneurship is the competition aspect. Um, it actually doesn't exist. It's counterintuitive. You can go out and talk to people. If you're thinking about buying a franchise, you can call other veteran or other uh, franchise owners, tell them you're a veteran, you're thinking about it, and they're not going to look at you as competition. Okay, you can go. And, and talk to people in different industries, not selling, just asking for advice, and you'll get more information than you ever thought. So they don't, the whole competition aspect, they don't even look at it like that. And that's, that's great for uh, transitioning veterans. So the second uh, block of, tr of training is sales and business development. Uh, has anyone been to SEER school here? So in SEER school, they use fishbowl exercises where they uh, put you in front of a video camera and everyone gets to watch and uh, they slap you around, ask you a bunch of questions and try and stress you out, right? We do that same thing without the slapping. <laughs> <laughs> we do mock phone uh, cold calls, we do mock uh, office visits and we let you see all kinds of crazy shit you would never think happens and it does. Uh, I, I, I got a chance to meet with a guy recently and he just didn't look at me the whole time he's just jotting down notes and, and what do you do you can't you got to leave a, a great uh, image and be you know have the high ground uh, as a veteran no matter what uh, I had a, I pitched a, uh, a group recently and it um, I was given the presentation everyone was looking at the presentation and there was one guy right in front of me just staring at me like this with his hands on his uh, under his chin, just right in front of me. You know, you got to just adapt and overcome. Crazy things happen when you, once you get out, and uh, 
you're in the, the regular business community trying to raise money for your program or make sales, crazy things happen. And so we kind of use that, that fishbowl mock training uh, mentality and philosophy. Uh, so one question we get is how are we sustainable? How do we pay for things? There's a couple different answers. We're developing a coding academy with our Seattle branch. Uh, Phil Potter, he's an Air Force veteran. He started and sold a couple companies. He's working with uh, the tech industry in Seattle to create a coding academy for veterans that's gonna get copied and pasted into all of our locations. So we're gonna have a partner organization that's generating coding talent, uh, technology talent, and ultimately uh, sustainable revenue to pay for a program. Uh, Lastly, we're working with the Case Foundation that was started by Gene and Steve Case that sold AOL to Time Warner for three or four billion dollars and a, an organization called Sit Startup Angels to help educate the, um, you know, the retired veteran population on what angel investing is. Uh, there's plenty of uh, retired folks that can, that can uh, invest five or ten dollars into a startup you add all that up and that's a lot of money that can basically go into new veteran owned small businesses that may turn into you know the next uh, Twitter or the next Facebook probably not but, but maybe <laughs> um, a, a quick story one of the companies that was part of the bunker uh, when we started a year ago is called Ride Scout it was formed by Joe Kopser and Craig Cummings, who are both West Point grads. Uh, they started uh, in 2012 and sold their company 14 months later for between zero and $100 million, but it was, it was closer to the 100 million. So 14 to exit, you know, and they, they just had a great idea. Uh, they found great developers and uh, collaborated and, and sold the company. They are now force multipliers where they're helping other veterans get into the tech industry, hiring other veterans, and the, the cycle grows and uh, continues. So we opened up the application window for our first training pipeline, which is gonna start on July 9th. Uh, we opened it up in uh, April 9th. And we're on track to um, work with eight to 12 startups um, and, and put them through our first training course that's been stress tested in Chicago. The, uh, the Chicago cohort is what it's called, is about uh, a month from being done and they're having incredible results. All their companies have raised money, uh, none of them have quit, they're all starting to hire and looking at growing and it's uh, really amazing to see what's going on in Chicago and, and getting ready to replicate that success uh, in Kansas City. We're going to conclude our training pipeline with what's called a demo day on December 13th. We're probably going to use War One uh, amphitheater and space for events, and uh, basically showcase the the veteran-owned small businesses that we're training. So I'm creating a world-class team around me. Uh, I'm kind of taking the same. Uh, Take the same mentality I had as a SEAL officer, where if I find a kid who has the potential to be a great sniper, I send him to that school, he comes back and he's an asset to my platoon. I'm finding other veteran entrepreneurs in the area that are an asset to what we're doing with the bunker, and I'm just taking it kind of as an ops officer mentality. I'm not a subject matter expert, no one really is on startups. There's too much to learn. It would take three lifetimes to learn everything. But I am a subject matter on, on being an ops officer and finding the best resources to solve problems. Derek B. Wright uh, recently went through the Sprint Healthcare Accelerator. Uh, he's an Air Force Academy grad, uh, recovering lawyer. Uh, he was a lawyer in New York for a couple years. And uh, he helps us plug into the, the Techstars network. Uh, Jacob McDaniel is a, a web development expert. Uh, he was part of a startup called aglocal.com. Aglocal raised about four million dollars in 2012 and uh, moved to Silicon Valley and Jacob stayed here in Kansas City right now I'm working with uh, six different startups that are basically post uh, where the bunker would take them they just need help getting in touch with angel investors and growing one of my favorite stories is KC crew 
it's an intramural league in Kansas City, Missouri, that was started by an Army veteran. And uh, during our first meeting, he's like, you know, I think this is going pretty well. I've got 6,000 paying members. You know, I'm thinking about growing this, but I don't have the resources to do that. Okay, so 6,000 paying members for a website is incredible. Like that is on the tipping point where once you start to grow, a bigger company is gonna buy you. So we're putting him in touch with the resources to grow into Oklahoma City, uh, Denver, and uh, Omaha. And, and without the bunker, he would probably just have continued what he was doing, you know, uh, not considering growing, just kind of, you know, running with the status quo. But we're giving him basically a launch pad and resources to start growing, and he's going to be hiring other veterans. So that's that's the, our key metric is job creation and helping create jobs for fellow veterans. Leasing Casey's great story. Uh, an army officer from Fort Carson. His family's been in real estate in Kansas City for 30 years. And he created, um, kind of as a hobby, a real estate uh, website um, where he aggregates uh, open rental spaces and basically single family homes. It's really hard to find a, a single family home to rent. Uh, he's doing great. So some of our current sponsors are the Veterans United Foundation in Columbia. They have actually 1,100 employees and uh, the two brothers that founded it are very veterans friendly. Um, the Kansas City Bar Association, uh, bars and lawyers, not uh, as in uh, <laughs> bar and grills. <laughs> the, what's really special, so the, the, the Kansas City Bar Association ha has put together a bank of pro bono hours with different lawyers all around the, the, the city for us. So if you just need basic help forming your company and filing with the state, they can do it for free. If you need help uh, filing a patent, they can do that and help you. So it's that those resources are as good as cash for a startup because so you won't have to pay that out of your pocket. And then Think Big KC has been wonderful for, for, to us. Uh, we're on the fourth floor inside their new space. Uh, Herb, who's one of the founders, is a, was a Black Hawk pilot and a Chinook pilot. And uh, they give us access to angel investors <clears throat> throughout the Midwest. And basically, we kind of draft off everything they're doing. So this is the ultimate goal. This is a talk in Afghanistan. I believe this is actually in al Udeed at uh, Sipsock Ford or one of the, the Ford elements. And this is a this is an incubator in Silicon Valley. So this is what we want to do: take people uh, who are used to working with shared resources, with a limited amount of space, uh, unknown environments, and putting them into uh, startups. So one thing after, after finish, I want to uh, kind of talk about one thing that I see and I'd like to get feedback on is um, the fear of failure. A lot of veterans call me and they're interested in starting their own small business, but kind of across the board, one of the things I see is there's kind of a fear of failure. And I think that is the single greatest obstacle to creating small businesses right now. It's not, I'd say lack of uh, access to capital is a quick second, but ultimately it's, it's fear of failure. So uh, once I conclude here, I'd like to kind of, um, collaborate and, and see what people think like why what holds you back why would you um, why do you think veterans aren't starting all business okay so the Coffin Foundation came out with uh, some statistics recently S statistics only six percent of transitioning veterans there's around 250,000 every year only six percent are starting small businesses when I talk to folks I'm getting I'm getting what I call whisper calls. So someone working at Burns and McDonald, who's a vet, will call me in their car. I'm like, hey, Sean, you know, I've got this idea. I, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid to leave. I'm afraid of a non-compete. You know, what do I do? And usually I, I yell at them and tell them to quit. But uh, <laughs> no, I don't do that. I, I put them in touch with resources to kind of evaluate what they're, where they're at. You know, are they passionate about what they're doing? Is it, have they developed the concept? Have they read books like the Four Steps to Epiphany by Steve Blank or Lean Startup by Eric Reese? Um, 
Have they done any research before they, they jump in? We, we advocate jumping in with both feet because we feel that part-time effort gives part-time results, just like anything you know in the military. But we want people to be prepared and have done their homework before they do that. So one of my one of my favorite exercises to talk about and um, things that gets people thinking about becoming small business owners is uh, the formula PERT. Uh, has anyone gone to a financial advisor and they're going to sit you down and they're going to say, hey, take $1,000 or $10,000, you're going to put it in this account, you're going to add $300, you know, in 30 years you're going to have $1.3 million because of the miracle of compounding interest, right? So that, that is true. That is true. But once you think about so what if you start a small business and you put a three in front of P on that formula? What if you put a 10? What if you start a small business and you have 10 employees that help you put $300 per employee that you make from their work into an account and that grows? What if it's 100? What's special is each of those people can also do that same thing. They can put in $1,000 and they can grow it and they're gonna have you know, 1.3 million what if you create a business and you have 100 in front of that, okay? So that's the, the miracle of compounding interest for small business owners. Not only are you creating wealth, which is generational, you're helping other people have jobs, which allows them to save and have a nice retirement. So the last thing I wanna talk about is kind of some opportunities that I'm seeing, and then we can kind of collaborate on and discuss why uh, there's such a lack of um, people getting into startups, and I'll give you my thoughts. So one of the opportunities in Kansas City is the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things are these sensors kind of related to the Smart City project. Opportunities for veterans is that someone's going to have to install these devices. And the, the, the geeks that I work with and talk to that are creating them, they're not going to go install them. It's too dirty. They're not gonna. They're not gonna get out of the computer lab. Someone's gonna have to install all the Internet of Things, right? Uh, agriculture. I had a meeting last Thursday with a guy who's been in the agriculture industry for 30 years, and they're desperate for innovation and for people to just go work in industry. There's huge amounts of opportunity uh, in the ag industry if you're willing to be a small business owner. Um, at K. You, they have a program called Red Tire, and they aggregate uh, basically small businesses that are looking for new buyers, new owners, and they, they help match uh, people who want to buy a small business with existing small business owners that want to retire or they're, they're maybe just tired of uh, running it. All over Western Kansas, there's cash flow positive business owners ready to give you not only a salary to work there a couple years while you transition, take it over, but they want to sell their small businesses to veterans. So there's huge opportunities. There's an estimated uh, like $4 trillion of small businesses in the Midwest. that are going to have to get turned over to somebody, you know, over the next 10 years. And a lot of times, uh, you know, the children of these small business owners live in San Diego or they've moved out of the area. Okay, so there's such a demand, KU put this program together called Red Tire. If you just Google Red Tire uh, KU, it'll come up. And then what I'm most excited about is uh, what's called tech transfer. This is a huge opportunity that's nationwide. So the government gives grants uh, for research at universities all over uh, the country. 99% of the time, uh, grad students and undergrads, they take uh, that money and they conduct research, they submit patents to the government and they create technology and then it just sits there. Uh, there's a program called Whiteboard to Boardroom that we're working with that is desperate to look for uh, veterans to grab these tech transfer opportunities that are already baked, that have already been developed with taxpayer money in a university setting, take it and commercialize it. One of the best stories in Kansas City of tech transfer is what's called iVerify. It's a company that's about three years old. They've raised over $8 million of angel funding. Uh, 
a guy named Toby Rush leads the company. They started with a basically a patent and a piece of technology at UMKC. Toby, a lot of other uh, startups looked at it, and Toby said, "Yeah, I could do something with that," and, and took it to what it's called. It's called iVerify now. iVerify is basically um, a facial recognition and uh, it can recognize the blood vessels in your eyes and give you access to your phone instead of putting in a password. All right, so lastly, uh, one of the exercises I go through with transitioning veterans is to really ask yourself, what am I a subject matter expert on? On the surface, I was a SEAL. If, if I went into CERN or said, yeah, I was a SEAL, I was a free fall jump master, I was a stag line jump master, uh, I was a dive supervisor, there's no transferable skills. Like, they don't care, right? But what, what was I an expert at? And I would argue I was an expert at doing the most with the intel and the resources I had at the time, either on operation in Afghanistan or during an exercise. I was always doing the most with the little resources I had and the little intel that I had at the time. And I, I would argue I was a subject matter expert in doing that. Why is that pertinent? Because that's what being a startup is like. That's what being an entrepreneur is like. It's always making the best decisions with the resources, which are probably little, and you're in an unknown environment. You're, you're uh, executing an unknown business model, as Steve Blank likes to talk about. Those, those, uh, capabilities correlate over. I'd also like to argue I was an expert in failure. I failed thousands of times through all the training I went through. I almost, uh, I, I had to recall, uh, I almost got kicked out of buds in second phase. I had to retest a couple different times and I was you know, inches away from getting kicked out. But every time I failed, I learned from that failure and I adapted it and I overcame, which takes uh, perseverance, like I showed, and it's what about being, it's what an entrepreneur takes. If I went into Cerner and they asked me uh, during a job interview, what are you good at? And if I said failure, they would probably laugh at me and kick me out, right? I wouldn't get hired. But in the entrepreneur community, uh, failure is a badge of honor, and no successful entrepreneur hasn't failed in the past. It's learning from those mis mistakes, adapting, overcoming is what makes uh, folks successful. All right, so my last comment, uh, I, I think about this all the time. The US military is the only organization in the world, the DOD, that spends billions of dollars training and equipping the, high, you know, the best fighting force in the world and pennies on the dollar retaining them. Billions training us. You know, there's been about $2.2 .2 trillion spent on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and wouldn't it be great if all the veterans have had those unique experiences, started small businesses that created jobs for Americans and allowed veterans to continue serving in their communities, that's basically what we're trying to do with the bunker, is capture some type of ROI uh, for America. So lastly, we, we you know, this uh, conference is about innovation, and let's think about what can we do to innovate the defense industrial complex. That's what it gets me excited because it's ripe for disruption. It's ripe for innovation. The uh, the old guard of Lockheed Martin and Boeing getting these massive contracts is not going to exist. There's uh, Google BMT Partners, BMNT Partners, uh, the general that ran the rapid equipping force for the Army, the Colonel. Okay, uh, he is part of BMT Partners, and they are going after. Uh, the, uh, the traditional status quo, and it's exciting. So lastly, I, I want to kind of collaborate on this. What can we do to retain you know, the best leaders? We're spending billions of dollars training and equipping the best force and pennies on the dollar. You know, Ben, what would keep you in, what would keep you in the military? Innovation, the ability to collaborate and innovate, Nothing. Okay. I get, me too. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else want to take a crack at that? I think that's a hard question because it's not just a job, right? Profession, lifestyle. There's a lot of 
benefit and cost that is really hard to define. It is. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it kind of speaks, you know, I was thinking about your question with how, you know, who calling you worried about the failure. I think that's the, like, hey, you're going to get out of here and fail. Like, yeah. But that's how you know you're, you're doing it right because you're going to come back harder, you know, the next time. One of the things that helps with the military is you have this giant support structure that people can fail at, you know, smaller things, but it's all right. You're still going to get a paycheck. Right. Or, you know, your your family's going to get taken care of. And you can, you know, you can be in some ways more creative or more risk taking, but, um, you know, but you're still constrained by that. So one thought I'd like to add is the the faces and the, the challenges that we're facing are getting exponentially more dynamic, more difficult. Uh, there's more unknowns, more variables, but the people that have been dealing with those are not staying in, they're getting out, right? So that the retention of that knowledge isn't, isn't staying in the military. All the all of my uh, 04s when I was at 03, they're out. I don't know one person that's still in. So you had a, you had a thought about that? Yeah, your the question what we've been um, I think it's this concept and you need to know it's in it. And um, there's a lot of really good ideas. I right? used to have that program, I can't remember what it was, but you had a great idea, submit it to the army and army. it's like, yeah, we'll take it and pay for it. Right? Yeah, yeah. But having great ideas that are coming from folks I don't know if it's super innovation super because you know it's out less. Or you know, this is your job in the military, it's not it's not figuring out solutions to problems and ways to benefit you know, do that on your own time, which you do. Go ahead. Yeah, to, I'd like to hit both those questions. But sure. In, in terms of what would retain folks, and the research shows that the number one thing because you you can use extrinsic rewards and and reduce and increase your retention rate. I mean that, that's it. That's it. There's a correlation there. Uh, but to retain the people that you want to retain, you want to retain the high end of the talent distribution. And the problem is we've been focusing on the extrinsic rewards, and we've been retaining. Frankly, we've been retaining at a higher percentage the wrong end of the distribution. Um, and I don't need to go into detail. Everybody here who's been a captain in the army knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, but if we want to retain that high end of the distribution. Think the number one driver is the issue of agency. Uh, that sense that I can make a difference. That's what this organization, that's what that's what Ben has created here. That's what this organization is all about. Definitely. To reignite that sense of agency that all of us had when we were when we had a little piece of land in Afghanistan and Iraq, we were responsible for it, we felt like we were making a difference. We're out there changing the world, you know, we're seeing little kids who can now go to go to the market. All, all that sense of agency that we had that kind of disappears when you walk back into the massive bureaucracy. It, and so that's what DEF is all about. And, and if we can reignite that both in external networks like, like the Defense Entrepreneur Forum, and in, I mean, you guys are all leaders. Everybody here is, you know, from the perspective of a, of a corporal, everybody here is them, way up there. Uh, and, and we had that opportunity to create that sense of agency. And it may be nothing more than empowering your PLL product at the motor pool to make the right decision about how to store the PLL products. But that sense of agency will drive this retention. Uh, and we've got to fix it wherever we can. Definitely. Go ahead. Can I just add that really quick? And that is, um, every graduate of the program that I teach in, one of our highest learning outcomes is getting everyone to think about their 15%. So going off of what Kurt's saying, we believe that everyone has at least 15% of influence. And by the time you graduate, you must be able to stipulate, this is my 15%. So when we have big decisions around our group, um, we started our own three person, Tom left, but three of us started a strategy team inside of UFMCS in order to help everyone define their 15%. So end every meeting or start every meeting with trying to predict or determine what's your 15%, just like Kurt was saying. Who can you, can you propel forward? Within that bureaucracy and within that structure, you know how to navigate it better than anyone. So how can you navigate it and where can you leverage that 15%? Make it 20, make it 25. I gotta say one more thing because I want to get at the, the other company. Sure. I, for the last year, I've been working for one of the number one innovators in, in our army, Lieutenant General Brown, and I've been his, his idea guy. So I have lived 
the, the pain of, of turning ideas, good ideas, into action. And we have hundreds of good ideas. I mean, and, and not a one of them. I came into this job with 12 good ideas and in a green notebook that I was going to get it from them. I haven't started a single one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was in a job that, that, I mean, if you ever wanted to get an idea, your idea into the Army system, be the SIG of uh, the Center for uh, you know, Combined Arms Center. I haven't gotten a single idea yet. What, what I've learned is you've got to pick one or two things yeah. and, and force Unfortunately, the bandwidth has been consumed trying to get a couple big ideas from my boss, mm -hmm. even to mention Army University. And I have learned how hard it is to do that. So I think the analogy between the entrepreneurial community, there's no shortage of good ideas. I'm sure mm -hmm. you see guys 100 good ideas a day. All the time. And it, and it takes the guy with the energy and the passion and the commitment to, to take that idea and to, and to build it and drive it through the system. And that applies whether you're in Silicon Valley or you're in the Pentagon. Very, very hard to do. Any other comments? Before I uh, wrap wrap up my segment, so um, one one piece of advice I give to transitioning veterans or, or folks that are still active duty is think about the idea of social capital. So social capital is not just you know social media; it's uh, networking. It's increasing uh, the amount of people that you know that you're not asking for help now but it might make sense to help get help from them in the future or just advice, right? So the key is to increasing your social capital as you're starting to get out and that will convert to financial capital. If you're an entrepreneur or if you're looking for a job and finding that, that job, and you have to start at, you know, at least 12 months out of growing your social capital. And that I promise, well, it's, it's worked wonders for the bunker. It's taken a while and there's, you know, we've been in the trough here but we're starting to, uh, to, to raise a lot of money and, and do a lot of great things. So the last thing is, the last, last thing, a lot of my peers, <laughs> a lot of my peers have authored books, you know, and are on Fox News and all this crap. Uh, and Admiral Losey recently came out and he wrote a one page, uh, he wrote a one page and he, he challenged everyone that's been out to be a silent professional. And while I agree with, with some of the content that is in, you know, his, uh, what he's pushing in principle, what I challenge people to be is a loud professional. And the key is to be a professional. We have too many challenges right now outside the military, let alone inside the military, to not be a loud professional and challenge status quo uh, to make people understand what the experiences you've had, right, in a professional way not bragging, but get the point across. Uh, veterans are leaders. Veterans can have more than just a, you know, a basic job at Cerner as an analyst. I be a, my challenge to everyone is to be a loud professional, right? So again, I'm Sean. Thanks for listening to me, and hopefully, you won't see a book from me in the near future. <laughs> the SEALs and, and Delta and stuff because they come to me about what I teach and I find out what they do. And I really admire you because with your job skills, you can build a contractor and make an incredible amount of money. So I want my hats off to you for what you're doing. You know, you're, you're taking the, 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 the selfless uh, path to help people out, like you make a living, which is the best of all worlds, making a living and making positive. Yeah, thank you for, for recognizing that. I think, you know, in 10 years, you know, what we're doing is going to be special yeah. and, you know, the, the short term financial gain of the, the contracting is just a blip on the radar. Right. I want to you know, blaze a trail. You know, I, I want to basically blaze a trail and leave one behind me for other veterans. So.